Come join Melissa and her guests on the Chats from the Blog Cabin podcast. From North Carolina, this podcast will have you feeling like you've known these folks for years. Listen in as they chat about life, culture, current events, and more, all with a special Southern flair. Curl up with your favorite beverage and get ready to be entertained. Tune in now for a unique experience that's fun and insightful. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of Chats from the Blog Cabin. You know, the show where I virtually invite people into the blog cabin to chat about life. And today we're chatting all about the chiropractor process. I will tell you, I am a firm believer of chiropractors because after we had our car accident, I went there totally all the time. And they're the ones that actually diagnosed my rotator cuff and sent me to an actual doctor. So I absolutely love that. So Dr. Staten is here but the rocking doc which i love is here to talk about that but before we talk about all that he does because he does imager a lot of stuff tell us who you are well who i am i'm the rocking doc on the hip the hop the happening i'm talking about the flip the flop and the crackling there ain't no doubt i'm on a jam while i bam and lay my loving hands on the next needy band so melissa bring the questions from your dome and the rocking doc is going to throw you back a bone. <laughs> what you got for me? Why did you start getting into the chiropractor? Because I, I, in your book, you talk about how, you know, chiropractors don't get, don't have a great reputation. A lot of the medical doctors are like, no, 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 they're not really doctors. Don't go to them. Why did you just start doing that? I knew I was a healer. I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And so I didn't know anything about the chiropractic profession, except for the fact that I had one experience when I was younger, my mom popped my back when I was a kid, and I knew I felt great after that. And then in my 20s, uh, I had a migraine and a, a, at a dinner party, and a chiropractor popped my neck, and my migraine went away instantly. I was like, that's all I have to do. I don't have to pop all that Excedrin, you know, and hide in the corner for three days with the lights off and the fish tank down. Um, so... Um, those two experiences kind of set in the back of my mind. As a healer, I knew I wanted to go um, into medicine. So I started my pre-med uh, in Houston and I worked at the hospital for three years and I worked nurses stations, admitting doctors, you know, doing rounds with the doctors, all that kind of stuff. And they just took me under their wing, knowing that I was going to be this medical doctor, accepted to Baylor Medical School and I couldn't find my niche. I was so disappointed in the type of healthcare and what was going on, the bickering between the nurses and the doctors on the floor and the people just getting sick and feeling awful and spinal cord injury and oncology and bagging them and taking them downstairs after I made friends with them. I was like, this is not working for me. There's gotta be something better. So I ended up interviewing with a chiropractor uh, in Houston and not really knowing. I was just trying to get into a doctor's office uh, mm -hmm. outside of the hospital setting. Uh, but most medical doctors wouldn't hire me because I didn't have blood draw experience, even though I had all this medical background. So a chiropractor hired me and I was in charge of doing all the exams and all the x-rays on all the new patients. 30 days later, re-examine them and just go over their findings. It was incredible. It was my own little research project and every single person that came through there better and better and better no matter what hey i didn't even tell her about this and i don't have that anymore and it's just everybody was happy and positive and i was like ah this is so amazing in a healing environment i want to be a chiropractor so i withdrew out of baylor medical and i went to life chiropractic college west in san francisco instead so at that point what would your family think when you say, okay, I'm not going to go the traditional medicine route. I'm going to do the chiropractic route. I know you probably got a lot of crazy looks and they're probably, oh, you're crazy and things like that. Right. Uh, you know what? I'm number three of 14 kids. Oh, wow. Um, my dad who built the original Batmobile um, was married four times and my mom was married six times. And we're such a scattered family. Nobody cares what anybody else is doing. I got no resistance or pushback from family. I was making my own decisions at that time. I was homeless when I was 17 years old, a junior in high school. My parents divorced again. Uh, and I ended up finding a little camper in the front of 
someone's house where I slept in and I showered at the school every day and I worked at McDonald's and I put myself through high school on my own homeless. So I've always done things on my own, you know, and with God's help, just saying, lead me where you want me, guide me where you want me. Now, you mentioned that your dad making the Batmobile. You have to mention that in your book as well. Let's talk yep. a little bit about that since you mentioned yep. it. You know, I just uh, I just lost him this time last year. So I love keeping his story alive. You know, he was one of the hand fabricators, uh, which was such a, a rare commodity back then, being able to create and mold and build cars with your hands instead of, you know, uh, 3D printing them today uh, kind of stuff. So it's a lost art. That's for sure. Uh, he started uh, in his own shop with his father uh, right next to George Barris uh, Customs down in Hollywood. Uh, but his his father used to beat him all the time and he hated working for him. So he'd go over to George Barris and start working for him and uh, doing some great cars. And that's where he uh, uh, came up with the Batmobile with George Barris. Now, my dad actually owned the car that became the Batmobile. It was a Futura. He bought it at an auction because it got a rust bucket from coming across the seas after a photo shoot. And, uh, and they just put it out for auction and he bought it, brought it in, was doing some work on it. George got the call to do the Batmobile from Hollywood. And they're just like, why don't we use this? Uh, it's got the wings on it already, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And so my dad sold it to George for $1. Oh, wow. And George gets all the claim to fame from it. But I got pictures of my dad working on it and all that kind of stuff. As We know the story behind it uh, within my family. But George Barris, bless his heart, you know, he's a great designer uh, and a great fabricator. And he did some incredible things. My dad did the, uh, uh, the Munsters uh, coffin mm -hmm. drag car as well with George. Uh, he left uh, George Barris's and he went to Gene Winfield, uh, who was just remarkable for doing all kinds of things like a bubble car and those types of things. So dad built three of those. Uh, he went on to then create um, on his own. Uh, he created the Ferrari Testarossa kit that goes on the Corvettes. Uh, he created the Ferrari F40 kits that go on the Ferrari 308s. Uh, he created the DeLorean kit, uh, one of a kind handmade that he was going to make kits off of that, but never mm -hmm. got to it. And then he also loved the Jaguar mm -hmm. XJ220 that they came out with back in 92 to 94. And they Jaguar specked out the car on paper and on clay and that sort of thing, but never built. You know how the prototype is always a little more exciting you know, and yeah. radical than the original production car. Well, they spec'd it out, but they never built it. And dad found out and called him up and got the specs off the prototype. He loved that more because it was more radical. And he handmade it himself here in America. So oh, wow. I have that in my garage, the one of a kind handmade prototype of the Jaguar XJ220 that Jaguar never built. Uh, and that's kind of a great story behind that. And that stays in my family as an heirloom to this day. Yes, I love that. I love the way that you you can tell the love that you had for your dad because the, just the, your eyes are sparkling as you're talking. But let's talk about, back it up a little bit and talk about being homeless at 17 because that doesn't yeah. go along with some of the stories that you're telling us. So how did that happen? Uh, again, I, I was raised uh, in a very abusive, alcoholic uh, type of family. Um, I had my bones broken, uh, my blood shed by my family members. And by the time I was 17 years old, I was ready to get out of there. So when my mom and stepdad announced that they were divorcing and my mom was leaving the state, you know, I was like, goodbye, good riddance, you know, go and, and let me have my environment where I have some control where somebody's not slapping me upside of the head every week, you know, because I didn't do something the way they wanted me to do it. 
Uh, so that's, you know, that just gave me freedom to go and freedom to fly and just create my own environment. Um, you know, and I just, um, you know, I was, I was a God fearing man at that point. I had this experience, you know, when I was 14 years old and this is, uh, coming out in my next book, uh, next year, it's called transitions coping in a cracked up world, uh, which is my memoirs. And when I was 14 years old, I was, I won a motorcycle. I found myself on the front page of the newspaper at 12 years old. And two years later, I'm riding this motorcycle through the woods of Idaho, just screaming down this trail and I'm through the woods. And it looks like it opens up to this field. So I just, I crank it and I'm just plowing through this trail. And I hear over my loud pipes, stop now. And it freaked me out. I felt it in my bones, like my dad was yelling at me, my dad, my father in heaven. Mm -hmm. and, and and it just, I grabbed my brakes and I skidded. My front tire came to the edge of a 125 foot cliff. Wow. That went straight down where they were building condos down below there. And I would have launched 50 miles an hour off of that to my death down below. So who was that? Who saved my life that day? Mm -hmm. And then I've always been a God fearing man and I've always been praying and saying, you know, I'm only here because you let me live that day. What do you want me to do? How can I help you? How can I serve you? Where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? Uh, you know, and then that's what made the progress through uh, the chiropractic profession. Now, I think maybe if I found out about osteopathic medicine, mm -hmm. you know, at, back then, I didn't even know about it. I probably would have taken that route because uh, it would have saved me so much heartache and frustration, not realizing that there was this huge clash between the two professions that started 100 years ago, you know, when chiropractic wouldn't join the medical field. Mm -hmm. And they started throwing us in jail for practicing chiropractic without a license, you know, and they, if you were a medical doctor and you referred to a chiropractor, you would get your license revoked. And so they were all, you know, and then they kept putting out negative propaganda over the years. Don't get adjusted. You'll get a stroke, you know, which is so mm -hmm. stupid and ridiculous, but you know, people bought it, fell for it, you know, and now it's a big race because, the chiropractic profession blew up so great. It works and people just get better and better and better and better. So that now all the osteopaths are trying to be the adjusters. And now you can get your doctorate in physical therapy. And now you can start manipulating as a, as a physical therapist also. So they want a piece of that pie too, because we've created such a huge profession out of it. Still, to this day, it baffles me that less than 10% of the population utilizes manual manipulation adjustments mm -hmm. from chiropractic or any other modality, um, which it, it's, it just baffles me because that's what we should be doing all along with everybody as a whole, as a society, to clear out all these imbalances that we get throughout our lives. And we could talk more about that in just a second when we go to the rocket box. And you know what? This is a great time to take a brief commercial break. So we'll be right back after this commercial break. Hi, my name is Joanna, and I would like to share with you a little bit about Shores of Grace, Shores Philly. It's a ministry located in Philadelphia. The portion of Shores that I volunteer for goes into Kensington, an area greatly impacted by homelessness and addiction. And we go and we take love, food, clothing, snacks, conversation, um, we believe that it is a way that we can meet people right where they are and show them the love of Jesus. Um, we have seen lives changed in big ways and in small ways, and we have built wonderful relationships with the people in the community. Uh, we have big plans, more we'd like to do, um, and we would appreciate any support, either through prayer or through donation. If you would like to donate, you can go to shoresofgrace.com and in the menu, click on Donate. We just ask that you put Philly in your donation comments. Thank you. 
And we are back chatting with the Rock and Doc. Now, you mentioned something before we start talking about manipulation and chiropractors. You talk about your book, your book coming out next year, Transitions, but you actually wrote it first before you wrote the book that you wrote that we're talking going to talk about. That's correct. Um, you know, I found this uh, publicist in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, and she was doing these. It's called Perfect Memoirs, and she would take uh, you know little old ladies. Uh, little old men, and she would uh, video and record and capture their lasting memories uh, about their uh, lifestyle. And then she would print it up and put it in a book and with some pictures and then have that for their uh, generations, their progenitors. Um, and I'm like, can you do that for like a big book? kind of thing because I want to and she was just like well you'll be my first let's give it a try so she came over once a week for like six months and uh and we talked my book uh and uh, and it came out really big uh, I mean it's thick uh it's got all of my stories all of my history uh which is incredible because um I've uh not only have um uh, I I call myself a cat because I've definitely lived eight lives. I'm on my last one. Um, so I've had nine near-death experiences uh, that are phenomenal from skydiving and another plane flew over the landing zone and I went right past his wing and his tail and I almost pierced the plane when I was skydiving. Stuff like that. You know, I fell into a 20 foot tree well in the middle of the night and they weren't going to find me until spring. Uh, I, I fell into a hole called China on a grade five rapid down the Snake River and I got stuck in the middle of it and I couldn't get out. I almost drowned. Uh, all of these things happened. I was in the 7.1 earthquake in San Francisco where the bridge collapsed mm -hmm. and I was right there. I was supposed to be on the bridge going into San Francisco, uh, I heard all the people screaming and yelling and I just, I had to leave it and get back to my house. I was in the floods of Tennessee. I watched houses and trucks float down the freeway, you know, and we used, I used boats to save kids and old people out of there. And we had to climb up to the top of the roof because the water was coming up and we thought, this is it. Uh, so I've, I've had uh, tornadoes, uh, three tornadoes came through when I was living in Tennessee, and it took out 27 of my neighbors, killed them all right across the street from me, but missed my house, you know, and I had to clean wow. up all the mess. So uh, it, there's reasons why I'm here in this life, uh, because I keep going through all of these disasters and God keeps saving me in order to help other people. Um, you know, I've so I've had all of those disasters. I too have been married six times. Oh, wow. And so I have experiences with each one of those uh, things that happened. Uh, and those are in the book. Uh, and some of them are phenomenal. They're dealing with uh, mental health issues. Uh, they're dealing with a 20 year drug addiction uh, kind of thing that I had to overcome as well. Uh, there's all kinds of stories in there about survival and making it through trials and tribulations. And I had a priest give me a blessing when I was early 20s. And he told me, he said, you know what? You are going to experience more things in your life than the average person does in their entire life because you're going to be put into positions uh, of great positions in the future where you're going to need to be able to relate to so many different people in so many different walks of life. And then that's why you have to go through all of these trials and tribulations greater than the average person on the face of the earth. Uh, and I've done that. You know, I've been through the Job experience where I've lost everything in 30 days. The house burned down. My clinic was stole out from under me. Um, you know, I lost my family split up. My band broke up. I lost my faith and my religion. Uh, and everything. And then I went to move to another state all within 30 days. And my truck blew up on the side of the freeway trying to move out of here. Uh, so, I mean, I've been through Job uh, all the way down to losing literally everything in my life and starting from scratch many times over. 
Um, you know, and my experiences in dealing with business and that kind of stuff has been phenomenal. I've started 12 different practices from scratch all the way up to 300 people a week, you know, fully successful, making $65,000 a month in just a three month period of time from scratch. I've had, I've had great success and I've had great failures along the way. And all of those stories are in my book, uh, transitions coping in a cracked up world and look for that coming out next year. And I want you back on when it does come out. Cause I can't wait to read it, <laughs> but let's yeah. talk about the book that you we're going to talk about today is how to adjust yourself and avoid seeing a chiropractor. Now, kind of when you read that book, you look at it and you're like, well, if you're going to teach this, then why do we need to go see a chiropractor? Aren't you kind of shooting yourself in the foot for that one? <laughs> <laughs> and does that not make me, the black sheep of the profession. Yes. Oh my God. All the chiropractors hate me now because I took all the trade secrets, you know, and, and here's where it comes from though. Um, for 30 years, uh, you know, seeing 300 people a week, right? Uh, and, and you gotta understand, I'm the chiropractor to the stars, all right? I'm the chiropractor to over 600 famous bands. Everybody from Ozzy to Def Leppard to Tool to Corn to Weird Al, Journey, Foreigner, uh, Scorpions, Iron Maiden, to, uh, they're all 600. All right. The, uh, uh, I'm the chiropractor for the Emerald Cup pro bodybuilding circuit. Uh, and I work on all of the big, huge muscle bound guys, including Mr. Universe, four time Michael Heron. And I'm the chiropractor to the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus no longer existing but every time they come through town i adjust all of the elephants the horses the show dogs the black panthers all of them and uh, make sure that their bodies are healthy and working right the way they're supposed to so i have plethora of experience in 30 years now here's the ironic thing that happened six years ago i'm barreling down the city 45 miles an hour and a lady does a U-turn right in front of me. And on impact, my portable adjusting table sitting in the back of the minivan flies through the air wow. and I get thrown to the middle between the seats and it, bam, hits me right in the back and herniates two discs in my lower back. Wow. All right. How ironic is that? Taken out by my own adjusting table. <laughs> so now I can't see 300 people anymore. I got to figure out. I can only see five or 10. How can I teach you to work on your own body when you, when you can't see me? And everyone's like, I got to see you. And I'm like, I can't. So I wrote a book called How to Adjust Yourself and avoid seeing a chiropractor. Now, it took me 30 years to put this exercise program inside of it. It's called the SET program. SET stands for stretch, exercise, and traction, okay? And so it's that one, two, three punch in the same direction that could give you the same kind of change in your body. And this is the exercise program that I basically wrote for all my musicians on tour because I got tired of fixing them and then they go off on tour and ruin my work. <laughs> All right. So I said, do this when you're on the tour bus and then come back and let's check you out. And guess what? They started getting better and better and better. It works. It, the program itself works, you know, and there's some tips and clues in there too about don't do it this way. Mm -hmm. How about do it this way? kind of thing okay there's there's little tips like that if you have to work on your own body there's a better way to do it rather than doing some of the old um, ways that we've been just kind of seen in tv and hollywood <laughs> all right i'm ready to fight <laughs> all right come on let's go <laughs> you see him do that all the time right uh -huh. yeah well how's that for hollywood education nice don't do that. 
<laughs> so you talk about tips. Can you give us some practical tips, especially when people are like, like we are right now on the computer, we have more of a, um, you know, cell phone computer lifestyle where everybody's like attached to it and they can't go. And I know you mentioned that a lot in your book. Can you give some yeah. tips to people to yeah, help? Yeah. And, and, help this is, and this is where the rock and box comes into play here. Okay. So I took the book that has the exercise program in there and I 2.0'd it into a new exercise program. And I took the three biggest um, postural imbalances in our society that I see every day come through. And what do you think they are, Melissa? What do you think the biggest postural problems are? And you Probably mentioned it. Shoulders and neck. Shoulders and neck. It's actually the third. And we know that as computer neck, right? Because everybody is hunched over their computers, hunched over their electronics, and it creates this Dowinger's hump in the back, right? And it creates arthritis in the neck later on. And then you got these guys, Channel 5, King 5 TV news weather guy up here. You should see him. He's like this, and he's like, uh, it's going to rain over here today. And uh, if you look over here, we got a little bit of lightning coming up over here. And uh, like, who wants to be like that at 75 years old, right? Don't you want to be like, hey, what's going on? How you doing? All right, yeah. right? You don't want to be moving. And so movement is life. If each of your bones of your joints are moving, they're alive and healthy. If they get stuck, they become arthritic and diseased. We got to mobilize them, okay? So you can try to do a general mobilization by going to yoga and that's a spray and pray, you know, or you could get very, very specific and try to do some, you know, if you can't go to a chiropractor, there's a way to do it yourself or go to a chiropractor, go to a physical therapist, doctor of PT, uh, or go to an osteopath and request. Most osteopaths turn into general practitioners that just want to scribe uh, out now. But if you start requesting, they learn it in school. And I used to train osteopaths how to adjust better in seminars after school, too, uh, because they just didn't quite get the full training. But they do have it. And if you start requesting it, some of them may start pulling it out of the hat and doing it. OK, so um, I picked the three biggest problems in our society, and they are computer neck. Sixty eight percent of the population has computer neck. Two hundred and thirty million people now diagnosed with computer neck that's huge right mm -hmm. and it's also it's it's the uh, medical term upper crossed syndrome okay rolled shoulders forward head posture and that creates arthritis in the neck and neck pain and headaches and shoulder aches and all that kind of stuff who wants that all right the second problem that we have is we take our kids and we throw them into school for 12 to 16 years, okay? And they sit down at desks, which shrinks both hamstrings on both sides, the back of the legs. And then that pulls the pelvis forward. So when they stand up, they bow leg out with their feet. Look at anybody who's got feet bowled out like this, duck feet. You see them everywhere. You know why? Because 76% of the population has duck feet. A forward pelvic tilt, which is called posterior pelvic tilt. Okay. All right. And that's what we call flat butt syndrome. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's flat butt because your pelvis is forward. It's not that the muscles are flat. It's just that the pelvis is tilted forward, which uh, creates a flatness back there. And if you arch your lower back and stick your butt out further, you can't because your hamstrings are too tight. But if you stretch them out, you can stick your butt out further and you won't have flat butt. And so this takes care of computer neck, flat butt. And the third one, 96, more than any postural problem in the United States or world, 96% of the population has functional short leg syndrome. That's the next thing I was going to ask you about. So I'm right. glad we're hitting on that. <clears throat> And you know what? If you ask the common person or even a medical doctor, um, oh, everybody has short leg. 
everybody has one leg shorter than the other. People, common does not equal normal. The reason why everybody, 96% of the population, and I did this study on 250,000 people, and 96% had a short leg syndrome. Okay, that's big. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why? Guess how many falls for the average teenager by the time they're 19 years old? Oh, I can't even guess because there's... Huh. Give me a number. At least 10,000, if not more. Okay, you're up there. 3,000 oh. for the average teenager. 5,000 if you played sports. Mm. But you're up there. You're right. You know, by the time you're 19, and what do we do with them? That creates every fall creates an imbalance in the body, a short leg syndrome, stronger on one side, overstretched on the other side. And what do we do? We throw them into sports. Go run, go jump, go play. We throw them in the weight room. Hammer the bent nail. Hammer the bent nail. Right? And that's mm -hmm. all it does. You ever tried to hammer a bent nail? What's it do? It bends more. Mm -hmm. That creates more compensation and imbalance in our body. And then we're like, Okay, it's time for your exercise program. All right, here's P90X. Everybody hit it hard. Linear, linear, linear. Stretch this way. Yeah, and it's all one directional and that kind of stuff, which is hammering the bent nail even more. Okay, so in my book, uh, this corrects the three biggest postural problems that we have. Computer neck, flat butt, and short leg. And that's what you don't want. Okay, and how you correct it all on your own. I'm empowering the patient to do it themselves. And there's a way to do it. Uh, we stretch it in the right direction. We exercise it in the same direction. And we traction it in the same direction. It's the one, two, three punch that gets structural correction. And it's proven guaranteed you will fix five millimeters a month on the average computer neck. You will fix five degrees of range of motion a month on the average flat butt tight hamstring. And you will fix up to five millimeters a month on the average short leg protocol. And the beauty of this is that you qualify for the program. Okay. And it's so easy. A mom can do it. You just measure and you can, it's simply, it's in here how to do it. And all you have to do is have your kid lay face down on the bed with their head straight and look at the bottom of the feet. And you can see, anybody can see that there's one leg shorter than the other. Okay, great. Which leg is shorter? Do the program. If you have a right short leg, you do the program for the right short leg, the right side. And then the other thing that makes this so spectacular and work 100% is that we don't do linear stretches and exercises anymore. They do squat, okay? If you're a runner and you're told to do a runner stretch, right, where you pull your back leg up behind you, right? You're stretching the quad. Melissa, how many muscles are in the quad? I have no idea. <laughs> Four? No! Oh, winner, 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 chicken dinner. Okay. Four, right? But if you take your leg and just stretch it back, you're only stretching the one in the middle. Oh. Right? And that's if that's all you did, you still have three tight muscles when you leave after you exercise that will pull that long muscle that you stretched tight again and you got nothing you have to stretch them all and that's where my program really shines we use the rule of three and we stretch circular okay our muscles round or square melissa there what would you just ask me muscles round or, or square? muscles have, round or square i thought they were long so i didn't know they had a shape yeah when you look at it under a microscope they're round. Oh, wow. Okay. Let me ask you this. Are legs round or square? <laughs> I think, 
they're around again. Yeah. <laughs> you well, now it. I see you're talking about maybe the circumference of it. You know, going right. around. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Now I get it now. Okay. So this is why my program works so well. We stretch everything round. Mm -hmm. We exercise everything round. And I use the rule of three. So when you stretch linear, yes, you also have to stretch internal rotation mm -hmm. and you have to stretch external rotation to, in order to get the group of muscles to elongate so they could work together. And when you elongate the hamstring of the short leg, you elongate the entire leg itself. And that's how it works. Uh, it's so simple. It took me 30 years to figure out this concept, but it does work and it will correct the imbalances of your body. So now if I empower you to do this program, all I have to do as a practitioner, a trainer, uh, a physical therapist, anybody, I could just measure you once a month and you do the exercise program on your own for 30 days and then you come back and remeasure. And then, the, you know, a, 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 an osteopath or a, a doctor of physical therapy or chiropractor, they may want to adjust or manipulate a couple of extra times right. in the middle of that because you have some other issue that's going on with that. But in general, as a whole, removing these three imbalances of the body, computer neck, flat butt, and short leg syndromes, we can correct it all. And that will save you $800 a month on the average bill for a medical doctor office. Uh, because wow. you can do most of the work at home on your own with a little checkup periodically. Um, and that's how it works. Yeah, I love also in your book, you talk about using things that you would normally find, like a pool noodle when you're doing your manipulations. I love that because a lot of people think that they have to go out and buy all this high tech gadgets and things oh, like that. Have you seen them? Like here, lay on this thing and it goes pump, 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 pump. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, <you're, clears throat> and you're laying on your back, but your head is cranked in forward translation. Uh -huh. It ruins the curve of your neck. Every single one of those. I've never seen a product online. And if you go into a physical therapist or chiropractic office, they want to put your head in traction, which works. But you have to go in three times a week, head in traction on a brace with weight pulling down. And three times a week at $180 a pop for six months. It will work, but that's the protocol. Or ha, 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 find something simple, a pool noodle. Uh, and I call it the rock and roll. It's in my rock and box now. And so I put together the rock and box, which has the products necessary to do uh, the uh, posture reset exercise program. Now, you don't have to have the rock and box to do the program. Uh, roll up a towel. Uh, you know, or something like that, or, uh, in regards with, you know, traction on the pelvis, I call them rock and blocks, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're pelvic traction blocks and you lay on those for 15 minutes a night for the average short leg and you put them in opposite directions and it will stretch, uh, the pelvis back five millimeters a month on your own. It's the same as a chiropractic adjustment every night, every night, every night in the right direction after you measure OK. And so if you don't have these, you don't want to spend uh, 35, 40, 50 bucks for these, uh, then roll up some toilet paper or paper towel rolls or something like that. Roll up, a, you know, a, if you're traveling, uh, a, you know, you use your shoes uh, to put those under in the right direction. Uh, mm -hmm. And it tells you how to place them all in here, how to stretch it in the right direction, how to exercise it in the right direction and how to traction it and correct it in the right direction. And it's all for travel. You know, these people were doing this on the tour buses for years uh, and it works and it will teach you how to do that on your own in that book. Yeah. You have covered so much, but there's a couple of things I also want to talk about. One thing you talk about is wallets and purses in the book. That's a great tip. So yeah. let's talk about the, that tip, the tips that you shared about those. Yeah, so, um, you know, most of us have, uh, jeans nowadays. Uh, and so we got back pockets. And so the guys are throwing their wallets in their back pocket. Now, 
with a lot of the pickpocketing things that are going on. Yep. Uh, you know, people are putting them more in the front pocket. Thank goodness. But that's where they should go. Things in your front pocket. You know, purses. Um, I, I know there's a, a, a glamour thing, you know, to have, you know, the big Gucci bag hanging over your shoulder. But those go one shoulder and they push you down like that. And that creates an imbalance. You know, what's better if you're going to wear a purse is bring it across body. And not only that, but change it. So it alternates cross body on, on different days kind of thing. Change it up. Don't let that, you know, sitting on that wallet push. Don't put handkerchiefs. Don't put papers in your back pocket, especially while you're sitting and driving for long periods of time. Uh, it's going to torque your pelvis. You know, if you sit on a wallet for 20 minutes on a trip from Seattle to Tacoma, well, which now would be 40 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, traffic. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, then you're talking about adjusting the pelvis for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And no wonder people end up with low back pain, you know, from stuff like that. So, yeah, keep them all in your front pocket and keep purses uh, uh, going all the way across the body. Yes, Better. I totally can agree on the cross body um, purses because ever since I got in a car accident and I had a torn rotator cuff and I had a hip surgery, I go with the smallest purse I can and cross body and switch it out because if not, yep. that one shoulder will start hurting so bad. And just, so and totally just keep it light. Keep it light. Yeah, you, know, you don't need all of that stuff in there. I know girls got to have their everything with them. No, you don't. You know, keep the everything purse in your trunk and keep the nice little small tote mm -hmm. um, change purse on you, you know, with the things that you need the most while you're shopping. Uh, the rest, keep it in the trunk of your car. Now, we want to talk about where you got the name Rock and Doc, because I think that's a huge part of who you are, your personality and everything. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I was um, I always had a band. <clears throat> OK, uh, and I always wanted to be a rock star. Um, and so as I uh, first became a chiropractor in Seattle, I started working at this clinic on Capitol Hill and Barty. The bass player from Candlebox, his wife ran my clinic. Uh, and so the band would come in all the time and I'd adjust them. And then I'd bring my portable table to the shows and they opened up for Pearl Jam and I'd adjust them all. Yeah, and then I started just going, hey, here comes the Scorpions through town. Man, I'd love to adjust them. I wonder if I could get them. Knock on the door. Hey. Anybody need a chiropractor? And they're like, no, you're not credentialed. Get out of here. <laughs> Damn. And I got 100 no's, but I got 600 yeses. I kept at it. I kept at it. I just showed up with my table, uncredentialed, unannounced. Anybody need a chiropractor? Yeah, I think the bass player jacked up his shoulder last show. Uh, go check him out. What's it going to cost us? Uh... <laughs> How about a photo with the band? <laughs> Can I have that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, come on, come on, come on. You know, and then the next thing you know it, I'm the guy to see in the industry. Um, because I just my my wall of fame looks like the hard rock cafe. Um, you know, with everybody, memorabilia, autographs, pictures, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I've just over 30 years have developed that from 600 pages. Now I kept my my music alive, I kept my band going. Um, and I recorded my first album in 1995. Um, and it, um, you know, it did pretty well. Um, and I just, I always kept going back to it, kept trying to use my money to finance my band, but you can never make any money as a musician. And I always made more money as a chiropractor. Um, so, you know, over the last, you know, probably 10, 15 years, I was like, I'd be adjusting them. I'd be adjusting foreigner, right? And I'll be like the drummer. Uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, Michael, you're uh, you're a great drummer. Um, would you do a cameo on my album for me? <laughs> I'm putting together <laughs> a new album. And uh, would you play on one of my songs? And he's like, ah, uh, maybe. I just want, here's my email address. Just send me the song and let me check it out. You know, and I sent him the song and I sent him the song. I sent him the song. And 35 of them uh, all said yes. 
Wow. Uh, and so after that adjusting table hit me in the back, and after I did the book, I couldn't see patients anymore. I started going into the recording studio and recording my album. Uh, and I just kept calling all of these musicians back up. And I'm like, oh, would you play on my album? Would you do a cameo? Yeah, we'll do that for you. Um, you're a great chiropractor. And, um, you know, send me the song. I send it to them. And they're like, wow, that's a great song. <laughs> Surprisingly so. And so, all <laughs> uh, right. Uh, it's pretty good. It's all inspired, you know, it, and it's like, you know, uh, it's chiropractic theme, if you will, uh, on your side, the other side. These are names of songs. Don't fall down, fall down four, get up five. That's the way you do it. Give it one more try. You know, I mean, it's songs like that, that are kind of, uh, it's got that nice eighties, nineties rock sound mm -hmm. that I grew up with and learned how to play, uh, my music on. You know, but I changed the lyrics to try to keep it positive, motivational and uplifting. Uh, and so it took us four years to record this album, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to be a rock star with all these famous musicians on it. Woo! Ah, squat nothing. Nobody has CD players anymore. No <laughs> like, what the heck was that all about? Right. And so unknowing God had a bigger purpose for me. You know, I wrote the book. I saw all these famous people. I wrote the book, big deal. You know, and then I, I wrote this other book and tried to create this new program and big deal. And then I, four years recording this album and did all of that. And then, you know, big deal. Uh, and then, so the next thing you know it this year, I had this concept. Why not put a package together and put them all together in the package on a, a one deal and then sell it as a, as a group? Um, and so I started adding, you know, something simple like a, a pool noodle is all it takes to lean back on your bed and get your head in traction for 15 minutes a night before you go to bed. Right. How cool is that? So I put that in there and I thought, well, you're going to need something for exercise. And so I created the rockin' bands. Right. I branded everything, kind of rocked it out. Uh -huh. So these are, these are exercise uh, bands that you use, uh, stra ankle straps that uh, help you uh, do your exercises. You know, I created the posture and I didn't create it, uh, another company, but I searched and searched and searched and found one that fits all, everybody. And it's cheap and inexpensive, but it's really durable and awesome. And it's a posture reset strap with a little sensor on it too. If you want to plug it in on your USB and you just wear this, for, you know, a, an hour or two or three a day. And it helps keep your posture upright yeah. while you're on uh, doing your traction. I created, you know, the rocking blocks. I branded them, uh, you know, and I've been able to negotiate with the manufacturers to get the price down. It cost me $317 to build one of these boxes. Mm -hmm. But I've been able to negotiate with the manufacturers and I got the price down so I can offer these now at 150 bucks a box. Uh, I pitched it to Shark Tank and they went, you're going to be a millionaire by Christmas. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Kevin Harrington of Shark Tank was like, this is in the top 1% of every pitch that's ever been done to me. He's like, you've branded the heck out of this. You've got um, a, 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 a revolution of new technology that nobody's done before. And you're addressing the three largest problems in our society mm -hmm. that nobody has addressed yet. He's like, you're going to be a multimillionaire by Christmas. If you put this on TV, you're going to outsell P90X, no problem. And we are. So I made a deal. Uh, he made me an 80, 20 deal uh, with Kevin Harrington. So we're filming uh, the new infomercial uh, to get this thing put out on TV to sell, I bet we're going to sell over 5 million of them uh, easy by Christmas. So uh, that's kind of uh, my latest push is to uh, get this rockin' box with all of my product line pushed out and who to thunk. And if you buy it now for 150 bucks, I'm going to throw in a copy of my book on top of it, as well as those other products. And I'm also going to throw in a copy of my CD to help you exercise and have fun doing it too. So who to thunk? 
that all of my years of working on all of these other projects would come to full circle and be able to create a new product line that will just simply heal and cure the world of all of these imbalances. Mm -hmm. You know, I've now pitched to the public school systems and we've got five superintendents on board to bring it into the athletic departments wow. of five school systems in the Washington state so far. And I'm gonna branch that out through the entire nation. Uh, that's gonna be my next protocol is training all the schools in this new posture reset exercise program. And that's my goals for the next year. Wow, you've got some lofty goals for the next year. <laughs> But wait, there's more. Oh, no. We're selling for an infomercial now. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I wrote a movie. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to do it. It just kind of came out of nowhere. And I, you know, I'm, I, I share the pedestal, uh, I guess, with two other like-minded people in our uh, history. Albert Einstein and Nicholas Tesla both only slept for three hours a night. Mm. And since I was 17 years old, I wake up at three o'clock every morning and I'm done sleeping. I go to bed 11, 12, and I wake up at three and I'm up for the rest of the night. I meditate for an hour on the thought that was put in my head that woke me up. And I meditate for an hour and I pray for an hour. And then I get up and I come downstairs and I create. And I create music. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poems and songs and things like that. Books and CDs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and just recently, in the interim of creating all of this product project this year, this has only happened since January 1 this year. The book, the CD, the CD released in February. The book released in May. This is releasing October 1st. Now, just pitching out this. So we're just getting momentum and going. But I had a downtime of a couple of weeks, and I wrote a movie. Now, I don't know if you remember, back in the 50s, Charlton Heston did a movie called The Ten Commandments. Yeah, I remember the movie. I wasn't around then, but I remember right. the movie. Yeah. I wrote the sequel, Return of the Ten Commandments. And it's not your Indiana Jones with the Lost Ark kind of thing. It's the biblical account uh, picks up where the Ten Commandments left off. And it follows the lost 10 tribes of Jerusalem that take the Ark of the Covenant uh, and create a utopian society, a little Hollywood in there. And then they come back in the book of Revelations and they create this uh, utopian society, all the Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, and they all join together to create a religious government at the same time, the rise of the Antichrist and the New World Order, creating man's government, two opposing sides primed for Armageddon using the Ark of the Covenant to come in, and it's spectacular. And guess who bought it? Valhalla Films. Uh, they wow. produce uh, Terminator and Incredible Hulk and all that kind of stuff. And I'm in negotiations now, back and forth and back and forth with my contract. Uh, and they're going to produce it, and it's going to be coming out in a, in a year or two. Uh, so watch for that movie, Return of the Ten Commandments as well. It's spectacular, man. It's got aliens in it. It's got all kinds of cool stuff. So now there's another reason why I want you back on is <laughs> want to talk about your book when your transitions, when it comes out. And then yeah. when the movie comes out, I want you back on to talk about the movie. So you can guarantee two spots back on. <laughs> you got it. I'll be here. So our time is almost up. I always like to ask, my guest at the end of every show is there one last little nugget that you want to share to make sure that you got across for people so they they can kind of leave it in their mind to be thinking about your body has the ability to heal itself and sometimes it needs a little bit of help 
from outside sources to do that. And all you need is a little bit of education uh, on how to do it properly in the best way. Uh, I think I have been blessed so much uh, through the spirit of creating truth in working with the human frame. Thomas Edison said it best. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but he will instruct the patient in the care of the human frame. And that's what we're doing. We're creating, you're the doctor. I'm just the teacher. Doctor means teacher. And I'm just, I've learned over my 30 years how to help you help yourself and create a way for you to work with your own body the best way that you can in order to heal yourself and use the power that God gave you to heal yourself. You get a cut, you don't have to put anything on it. Your body has the ability to heal itself and it will and it can. Let's stop hammering the bent nail. Let's stop doing 3 million surgeries a year on hip and knee replacements. And let's correct our posture and balance of the short leg syndromes. Let's get people standing upright the way that they're supposed to. Let's get standing desks in all of our schools and stop sitting down and making our hamstrings shrink, causing flat butt syndromes. And let's sue Apple for not training us appropriately on how to use their technology of the computer and phones and forcing us into these upper cross syndrome problems when they should have been teaching us all along that they make them upright and force us to be upright while we're on our electronics. And so let's put all of that together and let's create a better society uh, of upright posture people because when you're upright, you feel upright, you feel good, you do good, you practice good, you say good, everything is all natural and above. And remember, everything is down, change it like a pendulum swing, okay? And everything goes back. All stretches, all exercises from now on need to be done in full extension of the head. No more looking down. Oh, look at my muscle, it's so big. Oh, look at it, it's getting big. Look at my head. And I'm strengthening my neck like this while I'm looking like that. No more. Exercise needs to be done in full extension. Looking up, the older we get, the closer to God you get. Start looking up at him. Full extension. All stretches, all exercises from now on. I love that. So thank you so much for coming on and for sharing your all your wisdom. Everything that's happened to you in your life. It's definitely been an entertaining almost hour. I cannot believe it's been almost an hour. Um, guys, I will put in the show notes everywhere you can find the Rockin' Doc as well as his GoFundMe for his little kit, everything. And I look forward to having you back on again because I absolutely definitely want to read your book, number one, because I think it's going to be very interesting. And number two, I cannot wait to see the movie. Awesome. Me too. It's going to be exciting times. Thank you so okay. much, Melissa, for having me on. You're a fabulous host. Love working with you and love to see you again in the future. All right. So, guys, until next time, keep chatting and be blessed. Bye. Rockin with the Rockin' Box. <laughs>